Shut up and sit down. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Electrician Live. My name is Paul Abernathy, your host as always. And welcome to today's show where we're going to dig into cable trays. Now, cable trays can be a pretty complicated topic depending on whether you're trying to determine what can go in a cable tray uh, or what's the ampacity of a conductor once it's in the cable tray. All those things can be pretty confusing for people. So this will be a two-part series. Uh, the first part we'll be dealing with is we're going to deal with the the application of identifying the cable tray and what can go in a cable tray, uh, and then you know how we can position it in a cable tray. And then part two will be dealing with ampacities of conductors or cables once we put them inside a cable tray. So we're going to kind of do it in two parts. We're not going to cover everything with cable trays, but we're going to we're going to try to cover the meat and potatoes of what you need to know and uh, break it into two parts. To make it a little easier to understand. I guess before we do anything, like any any good code class, we should establish what the scope is of Article 392. And 392 is obviously entitled Cable Trays. But we have a scope.1, and we have this typically in all of our articles so that we can lay the foundation of what we're dealing with. So in this case, the scope is this article, 392, is the article covers cable tray systems, including ladder, Ventilated trough, uh, ventilated channel, solid bottom, and other similar structures. Okay, other similar cable trays. Uh, And so this is what this article deals with. But we have to have a definition of what a cable tray system is. So we have dot two, which is definition, and 392.2. And it says the definition of this section shall apply within this article and throughout the code. So anywhere else in the code... It mentions cable tray that we know that the definition is going to be pretty much covered by 392, but it can be utilized elsewhere in the code. So what is the definition of a cable tray system? It's a unit or assembly of units or sections and associated fittings forming a structural system used to securely fasten or support cables and raceways. So what we understand that is a cable tray is a supporting system. It's not a raceway. Uh, in of itself, it's, it's, it's not a cable, obviously, but it is designed to support cables and raceways. Of course, it can also support individual conductors, uh, and you'll see in a minute that can go in or permitted to go into a cable tray system. And there's many manufacturers of cable tray systems out there, uh, different manufacturers. They're, they're really going to people that you go to to get all those real uh, difficult questions asked. Uh, and answered about cable tray systems. So they're out there. They're available. Uh, there is a cable tray institute. I believe that's founding underneath NEMA. But there is one out there. And it's made up of all the manufacturers that make those products. And, they, of course, they have online resources as well. Where they'll give you a lot of really good information. And, of course, the manufacturers of these uh, these cable trays do put out instructional documents that are really, really, really informative. I encourage you to go grab those, if you will. You Google them. You'll find them anywhere. So what we're going to look at today, we're generally going to be dealing with what's called part two, is the installation aspects of of what goes in a cable tray system. So we're going to kind of cover that. So we want to start out with the dot 10, which is use is permitted for a cable tray, because that brings us some various questions that people ask. You know, what can, where can you install a cable tray? Can it be in a residential? Can it be in a commercial building? Can it be in a industrial facility? I, the answer to that question is yes. Yes and yes, either or. Uh, now, again, understanding there are some you know limitations that we have to be aware of when we're dealing with, with cable tray systems. Uh, again, there's certain fill requirements. Again, it's not a raceway, but it's going to kind of resemble that when it comes to fill, things that go in it, uh, different cable assemblies that are permitted to be in it, all those type of things. So we have to really under, understand what we're, what we're dealing with with it. So let's kind of kick this off by talking about uh, dot 10, which is a use is permitted for cable trays. 
And here's what the code says. If you're following along, I'm in the 2020 edition of the National Electrical Code, in case you're uh, wondering what edition we're working out of. It says, cable trays shall be permitted to be used as a support system for wiring methods containing service conductors, feeders, branch circuits, communication circuits, control circuits, and signaling circuits. So, again, I'm using this, I can use a cable tray very broadly. Uh, It also goes on to say, and this is a change for the 2020 code, it says, single insulated conductors shall be permitted in cable trays only were installed in accordance with 392.10b1. Of course, 392.10b1 is talking about single conductor cables, right? And when we're talking about single conductor cables, that could be an MC cable with a single conductor in an armor. Uh, That's an example of a single conductor cable. Uh, but also, a lot of times, um, USE-2 uh, or even RHH, RHW are treated like a cable. Even though RHH, RHW, for example, is listed back in uh, Article 310, which are insulated conductors, um, USE is not really listed back there as far as the installation practices. But, of course, it's in three, uh, 310.4. It lists it in there and gives you all its properties. Uh But you'll notice that in this description, it'll say that it's a cable. So typically, what's been allowed in in, in cable trays for many, many years is THHN, THWN-2, XHHW-2, you know, single insulated conductors. Um, But they're not really single conductor cables. And the code never really distinguished that until you get to the 2020 code. And then, of course, now in the 2020 code, we have this new sentence and it allows single insulated conductors. So something that we allowed for, for decades really was a, a tongue-in-cheek scenario where, yeah, we let you do it. Yes, the testing requ- you know, says that it could get CT rated on those products, and we know that that CT means for cable tray. And we let you do it, and nobody questioned it. And, again, all the flame tests were done. But really, the code said single conductor cable. And they weren't necessarily single conductor cables. Can cause quite a bit of confusion because it's really THHN is a single insulated conductor. However, we let you do it. It wasn't really a big deal as long as it had its ratings one out larger and, and all this kind of good stuff with the circuit conductors. Everything was good. Well, in the 2020 code, we now clarify that and say, and here's a new sentence that's been added to 392.10. It says, and I quote, single insulated conductors shall be permitted in cable trays only, were installed in accordance with 392.10b1, end of quote. Okay, so I, I read it again. So that admission now kind of clarifies that it's okay to put single insulated conductors in a cable tray as long as you follow the rules that are down in uh, 392.10b1, which was still labeled as single conductor cables. But if you follow those rules, okay, we'll let you put them in there, all right? Now, it goes on to say in the use of permit, it says cable tray installations shall not be limited to industrial establishments. So that by stating that alone, we know that it can be used in residential, probably not practical. But again, I guess if you have a 12, 13, 14, 15,000 square foot residential mansion, maybe this is a, one of the methods you could use as a supporting system. Okay, you can get from point A to point B. Anyway... It just right there makes it clear that it's not limited only to uh, industrial establishments. Uh, It also goes on to say, we're exposed to direct rays of the sun, insulated conductors, and jacketed cables shall be identified as being sunlight resistant. Um, Again, this is an application where many times we are permitted to use an exterior, that's an outside rated cable tray, and it might have PV wire in it. Okay, it might be that might be the, the method of use. Um, so again, just making a statement that if it is going to be exposed to direct rays of the sun, then it's going to have insulation that has that uh, sun res, if you will, rating on it. Uh, it goes on to say, cable trays and their associated fittings shall be identified for their intended use. So typically cable trays are made up of sections. And the sections are connected together with with section fittings, and all of the obviously the section fitting is identified for use with that cable tray system, and together it works as a total complete 
cable tray system. That's why you see in the definition of cable tray system, it talks about a unit or assembly of units or sections and their associated fitting. Because you typically will buy this in sections and make it up and you support it in, in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions that came with the cable tray system. And again, the manufacturers give you some really, really good details and descriptions of how they want you to do it. A lot of drawings, a lot of detail. Um, they do a really good job at that. So now it gets us to the uses permitted. We have what's called an A and a B. Uh, and B is the one we'll obviously spend more time in, but A is basically saying, okay, well, what types of wiring methods are allowed in a cable tray? Well, it says the wiring methods in table 392.10A shall be permitted uh, to be installed in cable tray systems under the conditions described in their respective articles and sections. So if you look at the table, which if, again, if you're in the 2020 edition, you flip the page and you'll see a table 392.10A wiring methods. And it's a pretty good list of all different types of cable assemblies and even raceways that are okay to be installed inside of a cable tray. Uh, and it's going to reference the article. And of course, again, like it says, you might have some rules within that specific article that you have to follow. But this is just saying what types of wiring methods are permitted in a cable tray. All right, so that was pretty cut and dry. It, it lists the type of cables or raceways that can be in there. So no problem. Follow the respective article rules for those specific, uh, like NMB, for example, NMB, non-metallic sheet cable, is in that list. It can be in a cable tray. Of course, it's got to have to be rated for use for installations in a cable tray. Not all NMB is, okay? So you got to look at the markings to see if you see it stated for CT use, and then you'd be okay. All right, now, so what we want to get into is the one that causes the most controversy, I guess, of any of it, uh, is 392.10B, and this is specific, okay, for industrial establishments. So this is going to establish that in industrial establishments, we're going to allow you to use uh, wiring methods, obviously the ones that are in table 392.10a, we're going to let you use those as well. But we're also going to allow you to use something like single conductor cables. And of course, as we saw in dot 10, it is going to permit us to use single insulated conductors now, which we have accepted in the past without any documentation providing that. Now, in the 2020, it does make it clear. And again, not really any concern over it in the past. But again, if you're a purist and you're looking for clarity, uh, now it's, it's, it's getting clearer, okay? So let's read it, what it says here in B. It says, industrial establishments, it says the wiring methods in table 392.10A shall be permitted, because you can install them outside of a cable tray, it's fine, but they're permitted to be in it. It's a permissive statement. Uh, to be used in any industrial establishment under the conditions described in their respective articles. Again, you got to meet their rules. Uh, in industrial establishments only, where conditions of maintenance and supervision ensure that only qualified persons service the installed cable system, uh, trace systems, any of the cables in 392.10b1 and b2 shall be permitted to be installed in ladder, Ventilated trough, solid bottom, or ventilated channel cable trays. Okay? So, again, we're going to get into B1 and B2, which is, again, single conductor cables. And then, of course, uh, the B2 is dealing with single and multi-conductor medium voltage cables. We're not going to spend really any time in medium voltage cables, I promise you. All right? So, let's look at and establish the fact that we can put any of the cables that are permitted in 392.10a. But now we're kind of focused on those single conductor cables or by virtue of the reference in dot 10, single insulated conductors in these uh, to be installed in these what? These ladder, ventilated, solid bottom, or ventilated channel cable trays. Okay? We're going to be allowed to put also single conductor cables. All right, well, let's look at the rules for single conductor cables. It says, uh, single conductor cables, again, 392.10b1, for those that are following along in your code book. It says, single conductor cables, and for all intents and purposes, single insulated conductors as well for this discussion, shall be permitted to be installed in accordance with B1A through B1C. So we have an A, B, and C here. 
Now, A is telling me that, okay, if I'm going to install those single conductor cables, or in our case, single insulated conductors, they shall be one ot or larger, and shall be, shall be of the type that is listed and marked on the surface for use in cable trays. So again, we're looking for that CT use marking on the side of these single conductor cables or single insulated conductors. Now it says where one ot through four ot single conductor cables are installed in ladder cable trays, the maximum allowable rung spacing for the ladder cable tray shall be nine inches. So very specific to a ladder cable tray, when you're dealing in these sizes, one ot through four ot, uh, that we make sure that those supporting rungs are not spaced more than nine inches. Now, I think your manufacturers are going to take care of that, but they do need to know what size conductors uh, uh, that you're you're putting in uh, side of this cable tray. They need to know that. Uh, the next one, B, says welded cables shall comply with 630 uh, part 4. So, again, whatever the rules that are there, I'm not going to read those. And then C is pretty important. Because when I put circuit conductors in a cable tray, we know they got to be one out larger if they're single conductor cables or single insulated conductors. But this one allows the equipment grounding conductor to actually be smaller than the one out requirement. And that is because, one, they're, they're not considered current carrying conductors. They're not considered circuit conductors. They're part of the safety system. They're equipment grounding conductors. And here's what it says. It says single conductors used as equipment grounding conductors shall be insulated, covered, or bare, and they shall be for AWG or larger. So this allows you the reprieve to go down when it comes to the EGC, down to four gauge and larger. Okay, I get that question quite a bit when you're putting them in a cable tray and you see the one ot rule, and then they say, well, what do you got to do about the equipment grounded conductor? Uh, and in this case right here, it can be obviously less than, than one ot. Okay. All right, so that's covering that. And, of course, I'm not going to cover medium and single uh, uh, single or multi-conductor medium voltage cable. I'm not going to, not going to get into that. All right, so the next thing that we want to kind of jump to now is, okay, because we kind of know what can go in there, right? We're pretty good with that, uh, is look at the uses not permitted. So do we have some uses that are not permitted? Well, uh, 392.12 says use is not permitted. It says cable tray systems shall not be used in hoistways or were subject to severe physical damage. Um, there was a submittal uh, a cycle or two ago. I can't exactly remember. Um, I know we've discussed it every time we have a code meeting uh, about a definition for what's considered physical damage versus what's considered severe physical damage. Uh, and at this point, we have no definition. Nothing has been you know put in the code when it comes to those definitions. Uh, there's even been talk about putting in something that describes what's called uh, mechanical protection, okay, and, and things like that. And, and we say mechanical protection, uh, maybe a rating where you know, for example, MC has a crushing impact of 1,000 foot-pounds or even 2,000 foot-pounds, depending on the size of the conductors in there, under the testing under UL 1569. Uh, it might provide mechanical protection, but it not necessarily meet physical damage protection, and most certainly not severe physical damage protection. I guess you're going to have to work with your AHJ and use a little common sense. Obviously, if I'm running something along the wall and I'm in a, a building where it's just used for like offices and I happen to run it on a surface, what's the real chance of physical damage, much less severe? Whereas if I install it in, let's say, a parking garage down low where cars could run into it or in a warehouse where forklifts could run into it, and I guess then that could be elevated to severe physical damage. Every, you know, the beauty of this is it's going to leave the AHJ to have to make that call and hopefully y'all can work it out and have a meeting of the minds and everybody can get along and you know what I'm saying? <laughs> work it out. All right. Okay. So that covers kind of what we're talking about that. So for next thing, for this episode, I want to jump into 392.22. Okay. Uh, rather than covering the you know the general stuff for the trade cable installation under 392.18, that's pretty cut and dry. You can read it. Uh, here we want to kind of jump into the number of conductors or cables that actually can be installed in the cable tray. Okay, and there's some things that we'll have to to look at this now. The interesting thing about 392.22 is it's broken down into a 
uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and of course, 392 is also broken down into uh, part B as well. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll deal with that as well. That's, you know, we're dealing with the single conductors. But the first thing we want to talk about is A, and we're dealing with multi-conductor cables. What's a multi-conductor cable? Obviously, you, you pretty much know what that is. That's like an MC cable. That's a tray cable, uh, that application where it's a cable assembly. And, you know, and you're putting it in a cable tray. So A of 392.22 says number of multi-conductor cables rated 2,000 volts or less in a cable tray. And that kind of sets the tone for the different types of cable trays. It says the number of multi-conductor cables rated 2,000 volts or less permitted in a single cable tray shall not exceed the requirements in this section. Of course, we're talking section 22. Um, It says the conductor's size shall apply to both aluminum or copper conductors. So again, if it says 4 out, then it's 4 out aluminum or 4 out copper. Okay, we're not talking ampacity here. That's up in section 80 of 392. Okay, we're talking about the physicalness, size, the the, 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 uh, circular mills and diameters. That's what we're talking about here, okay, when it goes to putting it in a tray. Um, it says the um, it says that the where dividers are used. Okay, so if you're taking a cable tray and you're segmenting it or dividing it, so in one side and another side, maybe uh, for the application, it says the fill calculations that we'll talk about uh, shall apply to each divided section of the cable tray. So once you divide it, you treat it separately. Okay, it's kind of like drawing a line right down the middle of it. You know, I'm gonna treat the left side. I'm gonna do it, and I'm going to treat the right side. So if I've got a divider that's separating it, just treat each one of them individually. That's all it's trying to say there. All right, now I won't go over every one of these in this episode because I, you know, I don't, don't want it to, again, this is, don't want to you know, belabor the lesson. Um, but we're going to talk about a couple of them and kind of give you an understanding of how they, how they flow because once you understand one, it really makes sense for all the other ones and it's not too overly complicated. So let's look at A1, which is dealing with a ladder or ventilated uh, trough cable tray containing any mixture of cables. Okay, so a ladder or ventilated trough cable tray containing mixture of cables. It says, now where the ladder or ventilated trough cable tray contains multi-conductor power or lighting cables or any mixture of multi-conductor power, lighting, control, and signaling cables, the maximum number of cables shall conform to the following. And here we have an A, a B, and a C. Okay? So we'll kind of go through this. You'll, you'll see how this works. And again, for the other ones, it's just pretty much follow the, the same course and path of, of just reading it and, and following what the code says. All right, A, it says where all of the cables are one, uh, four aught or larger, okay? So again, where all of them are four aught or larger means that they contain conductors in them that are four aught or larger. It says the sum of the diameter of all cables shall, be, shall not exceed the cable trays width, okay? So that's a first given. Next, it says the cables shall be installed in a single layer. All right, so again, I got a 4 aught cable. It's got 4 aughts in it. Maybe it's a 4-3 or whatever it would be. And I have an actual diameter uh, of that cable. And I'm going to take the sum of all of them, and in totally it can't exceed the value of the, uh, the um, width of the tray. Pretty simple, right, moving forward. And it's only one layer, too, so we're not stacking here for this size. Now, it also goes on to say, where the cable ampacity is determined according to 392.80A1C, the cable tray width shall not be less than the sum of the diameters of the cables and the sum of the required spacing widths between the cables. Now, interesting here is dealing with ampacity in this case, you go to 392.80A1C, it basically says 
where multi-conductor cables are installed in a single layer in an uncovered tray with a maintained spacing of not less than one cable diameter between the cables, the impacity shall not exceed the ambient temperature corrected impacities of multi-conductor cables with not more than three insulated conductors rated zero through 2,000 volts in free air in accordance with 310.14B. So basically, it's 310.14B is an engineering design, so that's kind of a near McGrath application, and engineers will use that to to do their calculation on that. Uh, Near McGrath might result in a higher impacity value, for example, than you might get under 310.16 impacity again. But that is referring back to an engineering calculation if this is what you're dealing with, okay? So that's kind of why it makes a reference to 310.14b, okay? All right, let's kind of get back to where we were. All right, so that's the first one. And then it goes on to say, again, um, the cable's width, again, shall not be less than the diameters, plus, again, the sum of that width, which is the width of one of the cables, okay? So you got to remember that when you're, when you're determining your width here, okay? Now, the one real reason that you can use the near McGrath, and that's why it makes that statement in Ampacity in eight, Section 80, is because, again, they're taking into account some values, uh, and you've got air that's passing around it because of the, the spacing and things like that, okay? So that might be something, but you need to work with an engineer on that. Uh, again, if you use 31016 ampacity values, then it is going to be a lesser value, and it's probably uh, a very conservative value, by the way. Okay, And many people who don't want to get involved in the engineer, or even engineers will say, yeah, I'm not going to do a near McGrath. Uh, just use 31016. That's kind of most of the time what they do. Um, so the next one is B. And B says, where all the cables are smaller than 4 aught. Okay, because we just did larger, 4 out and larger, but now we're doing smaller than 4 out. It says the sum of the cross-sectional areas of all cables shall not exceed the maximum allowable cable fill area in column 1 of table 392.22a for the approximate cable width. All right, makes sense. So if you look at that table, and I've got my code book, and I'm going to look at it with you, and we're looking at 392 uh, a, and you have column one, which again, you'll notice that it references this very section that we're talking about, right? I mean, it references it directly. And in this case, again, if it's, uh, let's just throw an example out there. If it's 16 inch wide tray, then it has a maximum allowable fill for multi-conductor cables of 18.5 square inches. So basically you're, you're doing a a raceway fill calculation in a cable tray that's not considered a raceway. And you're still going to pull the conductors and the, and do all this values for those applications, right? As you would anything else, uh, so the normal application, okay? And the next one is C. Now, C says where 4-aught uh, AWG or larger cables are installed in the same cable tray... With cables smaller than 4 aught, it says the sum, and when you see the other word sum, that's total adding up, if you will. Um, the sum of the cross-section area of all the cables that are smaller than 4 aught shall not exceed the maximum allow ampacity, excuse me, allowable fill area resulting from the calculation in column 2 of table 392.22a for the approximate cable tray width, the 4 aught and larger cables shall be installed in a single layer and no other cables shall be placed on them. So, the ones that are smaller than 4 aught stackable. The ones that are 4 aught larger, not stackable, right? And the reference to the ones that are smaller than the 4 aught the maximum fill, again, it would be the same table, but we'd use column two. And column two tells you down here, and it gives you a, a value of how you would calculate that out, okay? So let's just use an example so we can see how we do this uh, in column two of, again, uh, 392.22a. And we're, go we're going to have to do this again later, okay, when we're dealing with 392.22b1. So kind of get it out of our way here. 
So let's assume we have a cable tray that is uh, 12 inches. Okay, so you look down here, you see 12 inches. So you go across the right, and of course we do everything in square inches. We don't really use the millimeter square. I don't anyway. Um, at some point, we're probably going to be forced to do that, but not right now. All right, so I go and look at 16. That's 18.5, which is the square inches, minus, and then the 1.2 and SD basically is saying, what does SD mean? Well, the SD is going to be the sum of the diameters of those 4 aught and larger cables, okay? You, you with me? So I'm going to add up the diameter of those. Once I add up the diameters of those, that represents the SD. So I use a multiplication. I do 1.2 times that. And remember, solve parentheses first. And once I solve that, then I go to this 18.5, which we said we're using a 16 uh, inch wide. Remember, we're in, we're in uh, column two here. And I do 18.6 minus that value that I just computed. And that's what's going to tell me my maximum allowable fill for those smaller conductors, okay, that are under 4 aught. You with me? And so that kind of tells me what my a maximum allowable fill be. Taking into account, obviously, the larger conductors are taking up space in the cable tray as well. So this is just a formula for how to do that to tell you, okay? Now, if you didn't know that, you didn't know the tray you're starting with, and you could do it the other way. You could take the, the, the circular mill of all the conductors that are under that are smaller than 4 aught and take that value and look that up in Chapter 9, Table 5, and find out what it is for those conductors. Do that times the number of conductors, and then add that to the, the values dealing with the diameters okay, of the, the larger ones. Okay, so that is something that you can do with that. And in doing that, basically what you're doing is, let me give you an example of how you would calculate that, just if you wanted to. Just if you didn't know, you didn't already have a tray forced upon you, right, by a designer. They forced it on you. Okay, what I could do is, let's, see, let's use an example. And let's say I had nine, uh, no, that's not a good example. Uh, let's see, what's a better example? Let's say I had a certain, six conductors uh, that were two odd, whatever. And I find what the, the actual uh, circular mill is of those. And I have, let's say, six of them. So I do that value that you would get from Chapter 9, Table 5 for that conductor, whatever you're dealing with. And I do that times the six. And I get that value. Next, I take, I write that down. The Next, I go and say, well, all right, what's the diameters of all of them that are four and larger? Okay. And I add the sum of those. And I multiply that by, by 1.2. And then I get that value. Now, if I add the value of the circular mill of all the conductors that are smaller than 4 odd, and I add the value of the computation that I just did, and I add them together, that will tell me what minimum size of square inch that I need as far as a cable tray to accommodate both of those. So that's one way to do it if, if the engineer didn't already kind of push down your throat the size of the tray and you want to size and figure out because basically you can do this by determining, okay, what size do I need of tray that would handle this application, right? And that's the value that I come up with. So then I go over and look at the trays for the square inches in column one, for example. And I can just look down and see, well, if it was 19 uh, square inches, then I can see, well, that I need a 21 uh, or whatever the manufacturer would recommend in order to accommodate you 21 square inches. And 21 square inches is going to be able to accommodate the 19, let's say, in the calculation. You with me? So there's two ways to uh, tackle that using this application. But that's how you do the, that if you just, based on a tray that you already know, that's how you can determine how much approximate uh, area you still have left, right? To be able to fill with those conductors that are smaller than 4 out. All right? So that's just kind of giving you a, a quick synopsis of that if you ever didn't know how to use that or how to how to do that in uh, 392.22a. That's kind of how you do it um, in order to be able to find what the remaining space is for those conductors smaller than 4 up. All right. Where were we at here? I, I got kind of off track here. All right. Now, it goes on to say of those 4 out again, in larger cables, they, they are still going to have to stay in a single layer, okay? And nothing can be placed on top of them, all right? 
So those that are smaller than that, we're trying to find the amount of area to be able to fill, just like we would fill a raceway. But, of course, far and larger, no. They have to meet the requirements in a single layer and that type of scenario. And that is really how you would apply that. All right, now, of course, there's a two, and there's a three, and there's a four, and there's a five. We're not going to go through each one of these, but they kind of go through the same exercise. Uh, you just have to follow it follow it along, and, and I'll give you an example. Uh, three, which talks about solid bottom cable trays containing any mixture of cables, kind of the same scenario about the mixture of cables. It says where there's a solid bottom cable tray containing multiconductor power and lighting or lighting cables or any mixture, so it's very much a similar language starting out. It starts out and says, A, where all of the cables are far and larger. And again, remember, we're doing solid bottom cable trays now. It says, where all the cables are far and larger, the sum of the diameters of all the cables shall not exceed 90% of the cable trays width. So basically, you know what the cable trays width is? It can't exceed 90% of that cable trays overall width. Just a little multiplication to work with, right? Um, and it says, and the cables shall be installed in a single layer. Okay. Now it also goes on and, and that's all it says there. Uh, it's built in that factor, uh, of, you know, again, 90% of the trays width. Then B kicks in and says, well, where all the cables are smaller than four on the sum of the cross sectional area of all cables shall not exceed the maximum allowable cable fill area in column three of table 292.22a for the approximate, uh, for excuse me, for the appropriate cable tray width. So if we look at 392.22a, we look at column three, and again, this is going to give you, for solid bottoms, it's going to tell you uh, the square, uh, the, uh, square inches uh, for depending on the width. Okay, so you go to the left, you get the width, and you go to the right, and you'll see what value it is when it comes to square inches. Okay, and we can't exceed those square inch values. Right, that is your fill value on that table. And then, of course, we get to C. And again, you see how these are very similar. You get to C, and it says where it's four out and larger cables are installed in a same cable tray with cables that are smaller than four out. Again, you, you, you with me? We're kind of trailing on the same concept. Uh, it says the sum of the cross sectional area of all the cables that are smaller than four out shall not exceed the maximum allowable fill area resulted from the computation in column 4 of table 392.22a for the appropriate cable tray width. Okay, again, computation. And we just kind of did that. Same thing we just basically did. So again, we're in, it makes a reference to column 4. If you look at column 4, it'll tell you what size tray you're dealing with. And it'll give you the square inches. And then it says minus the SD, which again, the SD represents the sum of all of the cables that are four out and larger. And you simply take the, the, the square inch value for whatever the width of the tray is minus that little mathematical working out, if you will. And so again, in, in that is basically in that one, you'll notice that it's just the SD, Right. Interesting enough here, we, we don't really have a multiplier. It's just SD, okay? And the SD, again, is the sum of the diameters of all the four-watt and larger um, multi-conductor, multiconductor cables, okay? So uh, not really difficult. You just got to kind of do it. So if you slow down and look at it, and I won't go into the other ones because, again, the other ones are more descriptive and just telling you what to do, not to fill more than 50% of the interior cross-section area of the cable tray, not to be a depth of more than six inches. You know, pretty easy to follow. I wanted to do the two that were kind of more complicated for people so that they kind of understand how this is applied. All right, so the next one we're going to be talking about is now we, we talked about those cables, the different types of uh, ladders. Uh, uh, different, well, different types of cable trays. Now we're going to talk about B. And again, we're talking about 392.22B, and this is where we're going to use single, a number of single conductor cables. And again, we're going to assume that this is an, an industrial establishment because remember early on, that's the only time that we can have single conductor cables inside of a cable tray. Okay, so we've already established that. So now we are in a 
uh, uh, an industrial establishment. So that brings me to a point real quick. What is an industrial establishment? Uh, who defines that? Who clarifies what that is in order for us to even be able to do this? Well, good news for us, there is some information that's given in the NFPA 101 Life Safety Code that kind of tries to define what an industrial occupancy is or, I guess, is synonymous with the industrial establishment. As basically, it says, and it's a definition, and of course, it's probably changed. I'm using an old edition here because uh, I don't really keep that around that often. I don't do much in the Life Safety Code be honest with you, not that I'm not a building official anymore or working as a supervisor for jurisdiction, so I really have much need for it. Uh, also, I will remind you that all NFPA documents have a free view version on the Internet. You don't have to buy it. You can look at it free. Uh, just go get a free account, and then you can look at any of the documents on there for free. Uh, it says, the definition, it says, an occupancy in which products are manufactured or in which processing, assembling, mixing, packaging, Finishing, decorating, or repair operations are conducted. Well, that's pretty broad. That would include things, and in, 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 in also the appendix in the Life Safety Code gives some examples. Again, examples aren't all inclusive, but it does say that that includes things like laundries and power plants and pumping stations, refineries, sawmills, telephone exchanges. Ah, what else? Um, dry cleaning plants. Uh, food processing plants, gas plants, you know, petrochemical. All those things could qualify as an industrial occupancy, an industrial establishment. Um, a Walmart would not qualify as that, okay? Uh, I'll use a good example. Encore Wire is a manufacturing facility that produces wire and cable. That is an industrial establishment. That is an industrial occupancy. We can use cable trays and we can put single conductor cables, and as we found now, we can put single insulated conductors in there, one out and larger, that are listed for their use and has the rating, uh, one out and larger, uh, have flame rating on it. Uh, and we've also established that we could use an equipment granite conductor that is, is goes all the way down to as small as a four gauge if we want it in there. Uh, so we can have conductors smaller. Now, if it's cables, again, size doesn't really play a role because the cable assembly itself is evaluated for use, and it could have smaller conductors in there, signaling conductors, smaller stuff, um, maybe even um, something down as small as 30 AWG, as long as it's in a cable assembly and it's evaluated for use in a cable trade, then it's fine. All right, so we've established all that. Again, you're going to have to work with your AHJ, come to a meeting of the minds, uh, but again, I can tell you, commercial facilities that just sell products are not going to be something that I would consider uh, as an industrial establishment, okay? That's just my opinion. You can uh, go with your own if you want, however it makes you, again, you know. And the whole point is, it usually these areas mean that you're using a supporting system like a cable tray. Uh, it could be, in, you, know, ex, you know, no cover on it. Uh, it could be in a location where it really has to be maintained by people that know what they're doing. And so they have a maintenance and supervision staff, Okay. Remember that little notation, that little statement? Well, again, that means that the people around there know it's there. They understand it. They know what they're putting in it. They're qualified people. They're trained. Uh, they understand how to identify the hazards associated with it. Um, that is kind of goes hand in hand with an industrial establishment. Uh, and again, for example, in, in my company that I work with on Co Wire, we have a maintenance staff, supervision staff that, that maintain all this. Okay. Just kind of some, my thoughts on that. You can agree, again, to, to disagree. That's totally up to you. It's your prerogative. Now, let's talk again. Again, let's let's get back to where we're at, 392.22b for single conductor cables, which, again, are going to be single insulated conductors, again, by virtue of uh, the uh, dot 10 of 392 that stated that in the 2020 code. It says the number of single conductor cables rated 2,000 volts or less and, of course, that could be an RHH, RHW-2, which they also can get rated for 2,000 volts, by the way, in case you didn't know it. Um, permitted in a single cable tray section, uh, section shall not exceed the requirements in this section, and this section being dot .22. Uh, it says the single conductors or conductor assemblies, so maybe I'm plexing them, okay, triad or, or quad or whatever I'm doing, um, uh, shall be... Uh, shall be 
evenly distributed across the cable tray. Got to have a little more unity to this and how you do it. You just throw them all in there, right? It says the conductor sizes shall apply to both aluminum and copper conductors. So again, four aughts, four aught. Doesn't matter whether it's copper or aluminum. Doesn't really matter. Uh, you're gonna we're, right now. We're really worried about diameters and and circular mills. We're not so much geared towards ampacity. We, we worry about that up in uh, dot eighty dealing with ampacity. Right now, we're not really focused on that. All right. So again, so that's what we're talking about now. Again, like before, we're going to talk about there. There's obviously uh, a B one, a B two, uh, and it's dealing with what. The permitted use for these single conductor cables or single insulated conductors, as we saw earlier, they can be in a ladder. They can be in a ventilated trough cable tray. They can be in a ventilated channel cable tray. Okay, Very limited, but again, most of the time I see them in ladders, remembering again the, the rung spacing and all that rules that we just talked about. So let's assume we're dealing with a ladder or ventilated trough cable tray. It says... Where ladder or ventilated trough cable trays contain single conductor cables and, of course, single insulated conductors now, clarified, it says the maximum number of single conductors shall conform to the following. And we have an A, we have a B, we have a C, and we have a D. All right, so the first one, A, says where all the cables are 1,000 kc mil or larger, and that's some pretty large stuff, it says the sum, again, we're, we're talking diameter measurements now, it says the sum of the diameters of all single conductor cables or single insulated conductors shall not exceed the cable tray width, and the cables shall be installed in a single layer. So again, we're talking 1,000 kc mil or larger. These are fairly large conductors, if you will. So this is why the diameter kicks in, and you don't really see us talking about so far a cross-sectional area or anything. We're, we're talking diameter. Again, all obtainable from the manufacturer. They'll have all that information on their product cut sheets uh, without doubt. Okay. Uh, and it goes on to say, conductors that are bound together to comprise each circuit group uh, shall be permitted to be installed in other than a single layer. So this makes sense. So if I'm actually bringing... Uh, multiple conductors together into what's called that K, that assembly, that conductor assembly, it's kind of hard for them to be one layer. I mean, obviously in a triad, there's going to be one on top of the other. So this is just bringing that allowance for you to be able to do that. If I'm going to have to bring them together and I'm bringing all the circuit conductors based on the groups of what I'm running in that tray, it's okay for it to appear to be more than one level. But it's not because it's a grouping, and that only applies to the grouping. Now, it goes on to B. It says, okay, well, we already discussed the 1,000 KC mil and larger and what we do with it and how we space them and how we put them in a tray. Next, we're talking with B, and it says, well, where all the cables are from 250 KC mil through 900 KC mil. Okay, so we're dealing with this range. It says the sum of the cross-sectional areas of all single conductor cables or single insulated conductors as well, in this case, synonymous, shall not exceed the maximum allowable cable fill area in column one of table 392.22B1 for the approximate cable tray width. So it's pretty easy. So I'm going over to table 392.22B1, and this is an approximate cable fill. And I'm in column one, and the neat thing about this is it, Literally, under column one, it actually references you back to this, so it's kind of hard to get it confused. Uh, and I'll go down and let's say, well, let's see if it's a 12-inch wide cable tray. And I go down the first column to 12, and then I go over to column one. It looks like it's 13 square inches. So I have a f maximum fill of 13 square inches. And, of course, in this case, uh, the reason I'm using a cross-sectional area is because we're going to treat it kind of like a raceway for a raceway fill. I'm going to be utilizing Chapter 9, Table 5. I'm going to find the conductor that I'm using, and I'm going to, whatever the insulation type is, and I'm going to get a cross-sectional area, right? Okay? And then once I have that, that, that area, and then I'm going to basically fill this space. And if they're all the same, by the way, it's much easier just to take the value from column 1 and divide it by whatever 
the cross sectional area is of the conductor uh, of the of the single conductor, the largest conductor for whatever that group you're looking at, and just divide it, and that'll tell you again what your uh, cross sectional area. Now, if you don't have that luxury, they're all the same, then you're going to have to calculate them out individually, just to make sure that again, at the end of the day, the cross sectional area area of all those single conductors do not exceed the value of the the allowable fill in column one of table 392.22B1. Think of it like doing raceway fill. It's not overly complicated there for that one. Uh, And then lastly, well, not lastly, we got C. Now C says, okay, okay, we covered the other two. What about where it says where a 1,000 kc mil or larger single conductor cables or single insulated conductors, I should say, are installed in the same cable tray with single conductor cables smaller than a 1,000 kc mil. The sum, okay, you with me now? Here we're going to have to do a little, little bit of calculations again, and you already know how to do it. We've already discussed it. Uh, it says the sum of the cross-sectional area of all cables that are smaller than 1,000 kc mil shall not exceed the maximum allowable fill area resulting from the computation in column 2 of table 392.22B1 for the approximate air, uh, cable tray um, appropriate, excuse me, appropriate cable tray width. What are we talking about here? All right, remember what we did before? Same concept. Now, I'm going to give you a, an example, and, and I'll show you two ways that you can do this again because there is two ways. If you don't already know the tray, then there's a way to determine what the square inches that you need. Then you can go searching for the tray. But if you already have the tray and you've already been assigned the tray, then you need to find out what that uh, that that calculation would be for those uh, maximum allowable fill for those smaller conductors that are under 1,000 kc mil. How do I do that? Okay. Well, in this scenario, and let's, let's talk examples. So let's say I have nine 800 kc mil THW conductors in a tray, and I have six 1,000 kc mil THW uh, conductors uh, in a tray. Uh, and, okay, I need to know what's the required minimum width of that tray. Now, in this case, I don't even know what tray width I'm starting with. So I'm going to show you this way to do it first, okay? And then we'll address how it is in the column as well. So the first one I go, okay, I don't even know where to start. I'm designing this thing. I have no clue. Well, the first thing I want to do is, obviously, we're dealing with the ones that are less than 1,000. We need to find what their uh, area is, okay? So I want to go to Chapter 9, Table 5 for the insulation type THW for this size, 800 kc mil. And I've got nine of them, and it's 1.2272 square inches for each individual conductor. So I'm going to do nine times that value, which is going to result in 11.04 square inches. I write that down. That's your first number. You just write that down. Now I'm going to deal with these 1,000 kc mils. Remember what it says? Take the outside diameter, okay? And in this case, a 1,000 kc mil outside diameter of a THW is, let's say it's 1.372. And I've got six of them. So I'm just going to do six times 1.372. That's going to result in an 8.232 inches. You with me? Okay. Because the diameter we're dealing in inches. So it's 1.372 inches. Again, this is going to also be available from the manufacturer as well, uh, if necessary. Again, that you can utilize that. Okay. But let's assume that that manufacturer is not very helpful. (laughs) I mean, they are. They are going to be helpful, but let's just assume they're not. You have an approximate diameter that's also given you in Chapter 9, Table 5 as well, all the way on the right. So we're going to use that. That's your diameter we're going to use. In most of the cases, if I'm calculating out, I'm just going to use that value because most manufacturers produce it to the standard for that product anyway. So most of the time, you're going to hear manufacturers say, just follow what's in the code, and we'll, we'll let you be okay. So in that case, it's 1.372. So 6 times 1.372 is 8.232. as it's what we established. Now, if I want to find out what size or width that I need for my tray, because nobody's told me yet, then I'm going to take the 11.04, which is the, again, dealing with the square inch value. We had to do that calculation just like it was a raceway for those uh, 9, 800 Casey Mills. And then if you go to the table, you'll notice that down here on the table, we have to use a 1.1 multiplier. So we take the value that we have, and that was the 8.232, and we're going to multiply that 1.1, okay? 
because that's what the SD means. If you read the SD and you look at the notes down there, it's basically the sum of the diameters of the cables that are larger than 1,000 KC mils or 1,000 KC mils and larger. So I do 1.1 times 8.232. Uh, and when I do that value, that's going to be 9.05. So I'm going to add the 11.04, which is my approximate area. Okay. And I'm going to add the 9.02 together. And that's going to give me, because that's the diameter, it tells you to add it together. So that gives me 20.1 square inches. Okay. So that would mean that I'm going to look for a cable tray that's going to be at least, okay, that going to give me that, that square inch value, okay? Now, let's look at how the table wants you to do it. Now, if an engineer tells you that it's a, let's say a 16 uh, inch wide cable tray, okay? Well, if you go here and you go to the right and you look at it's 17.5 square inches minus 1.1 times the, the SD. And we already did the SD, okay? Our SD was... Uh, 8.232, okay? So 1.1 times SD2, and that's going to, again, that's going to give you, uh, and I'll pull the calculator out just because we, you know, to verify because we just did this, but I'm going to do it again. I'll pull my old calculator. You never trust the math, my friends. Always do it yourself. So here it was 1.1 times 8.232, and that was 9.05, so we're good. Now, in that scenario there, I'm going to do, and we said what? It's 16 inches wide, so it's 17.5 minus 9.05, 8.45, okay? So 8.45, that gives me the square inches, the maximum allowable fill area uh, is in square inches, okay? And that is 8.45. Now, for me, at that point, I'm going to go back over to column one, unless I'm talking with a manufacturer who can tell me what I need. I'm going to look down the column one list, and I'm going to look at it and say, well, which ones of these standards would I have based on this width? Just as, you know, how I would use column one to help find the, you know, of course you could go to the manufacturer. But in this case, it looks like I need 8.45. So in my case, uh, I have, well, actually, you're not even going to use column one. Your basic, what you've got left in square inches is 8.45 of fill. And that's what's, I don't know why I said column one. You have 8.45 uh, square inches of fill remaining in whatever your conductors that are under 1,000 KC mil can exceed 8.45 in that space, right? And of course, they can be stacked. It's the 1,000 KC mil and larger that cannot be stacked. They have to be in one single layer. So I can't have a tray where one side has got stacked conductors smaller than 1,000 KC mil, and then the right side, which is my single conductors that are 1,000 KC mil and larger. I don't know why I said go to column one. You don't do that. When you do this calculation in column two, that's going to give you the remaining square inch value. And again, that's what we use for raceway fill. That's how we're using it for cable tray fill. Then you use your conductors, and then, you know, there you go. And in our case, we already kind of knew that, right? Remember the example we did? We had eight, uh, no, excuse me, nine 800 KC mils. We already did it, and that was 11.04. So in this case, we wouldn't have been able to put them in here in our example because we only have 8.45 remaining. So we got to jump up to a, a bigger, uh, a wider cable tray, okay? So that gives you kind of two ways to, to tackle it, Okay. Um, most of the time, the engineers are probably going to already give you a width of a tray to use. And now, you, and if they don't tell you what all goes in it, this just kind of gives you a way to, to be able to calculate it out and see what your uh, maximum allowable fill is in conjunction with those conductors that would be in there that are 1,000 KC mil and larger. It gives you a way to kind of do it, right? All right. And that goes D. D is the last one uh, for this dealing with uh, single conductor cables, at least with the ladder of ventilated uh, trough cable trays. And it says where any of the uh, single conductor cables are 1 aught through 4 aught, the sum of the diameter of all single conductor cables shall not exceed the, uh, the cable tray width. Okay? So this is dealing where uh, any of the single conductor cables are one aught through four aught, 
the sum of the diameters of all the single conductor cables shall not again exceed the cable tray width, okay? And of course, one of the important takeaways, I guess, from D is this is a single layer because it's talking about the sum of the diameters. So if, you know, any cable in a, in a cable tray is sized one aught through four aught, then all cables must be installed in a single layer, okay? Because, you know, this just says, okay, you got all these cables, but where any of the cables inside there are one aught through four aught, well, then the sum, the sum of the diameters of all, all single conductor cables shall not exceed cable tray width, okay? <laughs> so this is almost going to tell you without saying it, guess what? Single layer. And so if I've got some uh, four aughts in there, I got one aughts in there, uh, I got a thousand KC mil in there, okay? Well, if I've got one aught through four aught in there with them, then I'm forced back to that single layer and I'm forced back to taking the diameters, okay? So this is basically just saying, hey, I know you might have different sizes in there, but if you got one aught through four aught in there, hey, guess what? Guess what? We're not gonna let you stack. We're gonna have to go with diameters and it's gotta be a single layer uh, and, it, and adding up the sum of the diameters of all those conductor cables that are in there or single insulated conductors, by the way, it can exceed the width of the cable tray. That means that stacking ain't gonna work for this application, all right? Now, if it's, there, you know, we, we, we remember we did cover the, the rules when they're 250 through 900, and that's all based on cross-sectional area, okay? That, that, doesn't, that doesn't talk about a single row, so there you got some stacking you can do in there, and those sizes should be okay. Follow the rules. Um, but again, just a reminder that uh, when you're dealing with uh, the one out through 4 out is intermixed with any of the other sizes, then it's going to kick you back into diameter measurements, not circular, not approximate uh, allowable fill requirements. It's going to pretty much push you back into a single layer. And it doesn't say that in so many words, but that's kind of what it's saying when you're dealing with the sum and diameters. Obviously, it would do no good to do sums and diameters if you're stacking. You with me? So again, so again, you can have different sizes, but if you happen to have one out and four out intermixed in there, boom, it kicks it back into one level, and then you take the diameters, and that's going to limit you to one layer. Okay. So anyway, that's pretty interesting how we covered that, um, and let's end up on the item number two, and that is the ventilated channel cable trays. Again, we're still talking about single conductor cables or single insulated conductors. And now we're, we're allowing them obviously to be in a ventilated channel cable tray. It says now, this one's pretty simple. It says where, okay, it says where uh, two inches, three inches, four inches, or six inches wide ventilated channel cable trays contain single conductor cables. The sum of of the diameters of all single conductors shall not exceed the inside width of the cable tray. Well, that's pretty simple, right? So again, it's not specific on size of the conductors. This is very much specific on the width of the tray itself. Okay, so this has to do with how you orient the stuff, how many you can have in a tray and all this type of stuff. Again, affecting ampacity in section 80 is going to revert back to different areas here saying, hey, 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 if you install it in accordance with, let's say, B1, guess what? This is the ampacity for each of those conductors, okay? Uh, and so it's going to reference it back to this one. When you get up into 80, it's going to kick it back and, and send, you, send you all the way back, okay? All right, so again, that's pretty much, again, we're, we're sticking in two, but we're not going to cover the ampacities in this episode, we just wanted to talk about the positioning and how you put them in, and I think we covered that pretty well. Uh, I can't think of any other questions except for some people ask me, can I install a cable tray inside a environmental airspace above a suspended ceiling? And the answer to that is we have rules for that under 300.22 um, uh, C2. And basically, if it's a metal cable tray system, or it's a solid side and bottom metal system, then you have provisions that say, yes, it can be in that environmental airspace, which is acting like a plenum, not a problem, okay? Uh, so those are going to be in uh, 300.22 uh, C2, 
And again, you've got all the wiring methods that are already permitted in that space, like an MC cable, AC cable. Uh, obviously, non-metallic products wouldn't be permitted there. Uh, but rigid, intermediate, all that can be in that location. So again, so if it's a metal uh, metal cable tray, then again, all of the types that are listed in 300.22C1, like I just mentioned, are perfectly fine. They can go in there, no problem. Now, if it's a solid side and a solid bottom type of metal cable tray, then all of those wiring methods could go in there. But all of the wiring methods that are listed in 392.10A that we talked about at the beginning of this episode, they can go in there. But guess what? Because it's a solid side and solid bottom, okay, guess what? Now I can also install single insulated conductors or single conductor cables in there. Again, providing that it's what? An industrial establishment. And we'll let you determine what that is with your AHJ. Hopefully you got something out of today's show. Again, thanks for listening uh, and stay tuned for part two which will kind of get into some ampacities and how they relate and things like that. So hopefully you got something out of it. Uh, Until next time, folks, stay safe. God bless. Shut up and sit down.